This was a, a difficult uh, topic to, to address for me because uh, trying to cut it down, I have so much material that uh, we want to make sure that, uh, uh, that we get out of here in a reasonable time. But there's a lot of things that went on in 2011. So I'm going to try to break this down into talking a little bit about anatomy of flooding and then also getting into what we experienced in 2011, both in the Midwest and here on the East Coast. Um, first of all, we'll just, just define what we're talking about. There's a long technical definition that the USGS uses, and, uh, but I really like the bottom. Too much water and too little time in one location. And so you, basically, we have this all over the country. And so why is it important? Over the past 30 years in the US, flooding, as Bill has mentioned, 90 lives lost in excess of $7 billion annually. Uh, it occurs in all 50 states. All months of the year, we have the floods and uh, we have more fatalities than any other severe weather phenomena, related phenomena, with the exception of heat. Uh, heat and drought, uh, you know, it's a little harder to quantify when somebody dies. It's easy to, to know they died of flooding, but uh, heat does take a lot of lives as well. In the United States alone, there are 3,800 towns and cities, over 2,500 inhabitants that are in the floodplain. And that's why we got a problem. We're at the intersection of human population and a natural hazard. It only becomes a disaster when people uh, or property uh, are impacted. Uh, when we want to characterize and understand floods, these are some of the things we try to think about, talk about, understand. The magnitude, cause of floods, what's the geographic context, why is it flood in one spot and not another. Uh, probability and frequency, if we're looking at risk analysis, we have to know something about that. How is it varying with time? And then the process understanding, when you have rain fall on the ground, what's the physical process that governs it? Where do we want to model that? And what's the so what? Why are we just a bunch of scientists wanting to know this and engineers? The so what is we're trying to mitigate uh, floods, we're trying to provide risk awareness to people, as well as we look at environmental damages that do and, and, and that happen and how does that flooding affect the uh, biota and, and the natural ecosystem. So what is the USGS role in this? And I want to kind of set the context of this because I get asked this a lot. What is, what is USGS? Aren't you just about geology? And we have a role in, in most of the earth sciences, in the, in the natural sciences, and the biological sciences, and, and we characterize them in, in the hazards area in four areas. Observations, fundamental understanding, assessment products and services, and, and effective situational awareness. What I mean by assessment products, that would be things like flood maps, that we're assessing the floods, flood probability, the risk awareness or the, the uh, effective situational awareness, we things like we put out on the web, the uh, real-time flood data and things like that. How high is the river? What is it doing right now? Uh, when is the, is the river cresting? Things like that. If we look at all these uh, in our fundamental understanding and our observations and our situational awareness, they're all kind of interrelated. And this is just sort of a context that we use to sort of formulate our science and our data collection around. So if I start about, I start with our observations, that's really the backbone of any scientific understanding and, and, and really for societal action. If you want to decide if you're a homeowner out there, hey, do I move out or do I not? Is this flood going to affect me? You need to have some information, right? You have to have some observations. So we're going to start with that. And what do we observe during floods? Precip, stream flow, watershed characteristics are very important. They're not necessarily just during a flood. We need to know something about the watershed. And then what is the response to floods, the earth, environmental, and biological response? You know, during the 1993 floods, we had a tremendous biological response in the fish population. Uh, it was detrimental to the humans, but the fish really thrived after the 93 flood just because of the dynamics of the flood and the interaction there. And so not only are we interested in the risk awareness things, but what, what's going on after the flooding happens to the natural systems? Um, what I'm going to talk about tonight and going to concentrate on when we talk about observations, we're going to be talking about volumetric stream flow. That's our, one of our basic data program uh, things that we do within the USGS uh, that's absolutely critical to flood uh, science and, flood, and understanding of floods. And this is a, a picture of the United States or a graphic of the United States showing the distribution of our stream gauges around the country. We have over 7,800 stream gauges that are, uh, are there and operational 24-7 and they're reporting out on the web and, and a number of other agencies, not only USGS, but other agencies depend on this, especially during floods. This is just some pictures of some stream gauges. Uh, I'm not going to get into detail about stream gauges. Probably, those of you veterans of these lectures have probably heard other uh, discussions about those, and that's not my point here. But this graphic is just to show that we have it from the, from the Rockies to the West Coast all the way across the Midwest and, and the eastern part of the United States. And 
when we talk about a stream gauge, really quickly, a, a, a 30 second primer on stream gauging, we have a sensor out there that looks sort of like this on the left. That's an old type of stilling well. We, we have much more compact type of stream gauges now. But the bottom line is we sense the water elevation 24-7, sometimes every five minutes, sometimes every minute, sometimes every hour. But water elevation is not what we need. It's important, but we need volumetric stream flow. And so what we do is we get out and collect a lot of, uh, of observations of the volumetric stream flow, cubic feet per second. You can think of it in gallons per minute is another expression for the volumetric uh, stream flow. And we will relate the elevation of the water surface to that volumetric stream flow in the form of what's called a rating curve down here on the left. And so we're collecting stage as a surrogate and we're getting out of that stream flow, okay? And so those little red dots you see on the, uh, on the graphic down in the lower left are discrete observations where we had one of our staff out there collecting data at that point in time, they knew what the stage was, they, knew, they collected the volumetric stream flow, and they could plot that, and we come up with a rating curve. And on the right is what you see the final product, is we have a, a, what's called a hydrograph, where we have both the stage and the discharge plotted there. Actually, I think that's only discharge. But in the blue is the stage, uh, or the discharge hydrograph. The red dots are where we actually collected the street data, and that's, that's the information we collect. So we're collecting 24 hours a day, seven days a week, we're collecting the stage, but we're putting out the product to stream flow, volumetric stream flow. And this is just a graphic during the 19, uh, or the 2011 floods on the Mississippi River. This is immediately downstream of Cairo, Illinois, uh, where the Ohio and the Mississippi River meet. And this is, on the upper left, is a, a boat uh, that we have, an acoustic Doppler current profiler, which is an instrument that we use. In the right, you see the little cartoon. It's sending, it's using uh, sound waves to bounce off the particles in the water, and it's receiving that, and it's able to, through the Doppler principle, to get a three-dimensional velocity and the depth of the river. And so they're going back and forth across the stream, as you see on the, on the left there, and they are determining the depth and they're determining the velocity, and that product gives us volumetric stream flow. And then the lower part is a cross-section of what that, that channel looks like. You can see there the, the maximum depth is about 118 feet over on the left side, and that's near the Kentucky shore. And they're going all the way across more than a mile over to the levee on the Missouri shore. And so you can just kind of get an idea of what the depths, and, and these instruments uh, are revolutionary. In 1993, before we really used these uh, in, in a widespread manner, unless we had a bridge, uh, we were pretty much at a loss of making a discharge measurement. We could do it out of a boat, but it was a lot of work. I made discharge measurements on the Mississippi River at Thebes. We hung under a railroad bridge in an old car that was built in 1948, and every time the, the, the train would come by, it just rock you like crazy. And we're lowering a 300-pound weight and a spinning cup current meter, and it would take us five to six hours to make a measurement. In 2011, we could make these measurements in about 45 minutes. And the only reason it took 45 minutes was because you're going almost two miles across the river. And so we're able to collect a lot better data, a lot quicker, and a lot more uh, safer. Um, this is a hydrograph, and I'm just going to throw this up. And again, in this part of the talk, I'm just kind of introducing you to the observation side of things, where we can kind of set a context for what we're talking about. This is a hydrograph, which is... Uh, as time plotted on the x-axis and on the y-axis, we've got volumetric discharge. And this is our gauging station, the Mississippi River, Vicksburg, Mississippi. And that's 2 million cubic feet per second. All right, so to get an idea, if you multiply roughly 7.5 uh, times that value, that gives you gallons per second. Okay, there's roughly 7.5 gallons in a, in a cubic foot. So we're basically talking there somewhere in the neighborhood of 16 million gallons per second, uh, greater than that actually, uh, at, Vix, at Vicksburg during the peak of the flood. So that's a whole lot of water. Um, and as we look and put in context, this is uh, our annual peak discharge for every year that we've collected data at Vicksburg. And you can see the 2011 flood there on the very end, and that is the peak of record. That is the all-time record. Uh, if anybody's read John Barry's book called Rising Tide, it's about the 1927 flood and the, and the geopolitical dynamics going on there after that flood and all that. Uh, 
The 27 flood is there, the other one that's almost as big as this one. So the, the, 19, the 2011 flood was the granddaddy at this point in terms of volumetric flow at this point in the river. Now at other points on the Mississippi River, it's a very dynamic system. It didn't set the record. It was near it, but it wasn't quite the record. But here at Vicksburg, we have a record flood during 2011. All right, so a product I'm going to highlight here in a second is Water Watch. And, and one of the things that we, we, we really stress is the situational awareness. This is a product that you can get on, on Water Watch. On the left, it shows every stream gauge that we've got reporting in real time in the country. And this is May 1st, 2011. You could look up August 1, 2012 right now. You can get on the web. It's waterwatch.usgs.gov. But it, it puts in context hydrologically every gauge that we have more than 25 or 30 years of record it will put in context how it compares with all the other May 1st in the, in the record, okay? So if it's in the cooler colors, it means we've got higher flows compared to all the other May 1st. If it's the warmer colors, uh, especially if it's red, that's the lowest value of flow we've had for that particular day in the year. And then in the lower right is another product within WaterWatch that gives us all the flood data. So the black um, triangles there, uh, are, are the sites that we've got that are above flood stage. And if it's not quite above flood stage, but it's in the higher end of the spectrum for the flows, it plots the 95 to 98 percent and the 90, uh, greater than 99th percentile. That means 99 percent of the flows were less than that value in that period, of, for the period of record. So this is a situational awareness product, and now that we're in a drought, you could actually use this product to look around the country and see where are the rivers low and where are they high, okay? And that's kind of something that's a, it gives you kind of a good thing to put the flow today if you're interested in a particular gauging station uh, in context, all right? So <clears throat> a, a major product that we have is our stream gauge data, and we feed that to the National Weather Service. And what you're seeing there is a forecast. So the forecast, we need to know on major rivers around the country and some of the smaller rivers, what is the river going to crest at? Because emergency managers need to make decisions. Uh, people need to make decisions about their lives. And so we can look four or five days out at what the flood is going to do and how high it's going to get. And a big uh, component of that is the stream gauge data that the USGS provides to the Weather Service. It allows them to calibrate their models and validate their models to give an idea of what the, the if, if the model, if the, the, the observations that we use are crucial because if the model's wrong and if they're off by a foot or two, that makes a huge difference of whether they built the levee up or whether they decide to evacuate a town or whatever. So it's very crucial. <clears throat> the last point I want to make about our data is we're moving now towards from the point of just forecasting a flood at a point to now we're looking at inundation maps. And one product that the USGS is working on in concert with a number of other agencies, including the Weather Service, is to put out these real-time flood inundation maps where you as a citizen uh, could look on one of these maps and say, okay, the forecast is for 28 feet tomorrow or the next day, but that may not mean much to you. But if you can look in context with a map and see spatially whether something's gonna get wet, i.e. your house, uh, that means a lot more than just 28 feet on a, on a stage hydrograph. It, it puts in context. So this is still in the early development phases. We're, we're developing these maps around the country. Uh, it's not widespread yet, but that's coming. That's the kind of the future of where we're going to be at uh, with, uh, with looking at flood forecasting. So if we look at observations and research together. So we've been talking about observations, and then we took and, and look at fundamental understanding in our research. We, we get that... Uh, we do our research, we get to the point of fundamental understanding. And that's the next part I want to talk a little bit about, is we have floods based on the type. We've got rainfall floods, we have snow melt floods, we have rain on snow floods, storm tide floods, we have man-made dam break floods. You're not that far from Johnstown, Pennsylvania, uh, more than 2,000 people killed, that was uh, 1889. Uh, there's also the geologic process control floods. Not too many happen these days, but the, the days of when we had glaciers covering uh, North America, this was a, a more common phenomenon. Some of the biggest floods that we've looked at in the paleo uh, um, studies show that those glacial outburst floods, uh, we looked at 2 million CFS uh, at, on the Mississippi River at Vicksburg. That would be a very small glacial outburst flood. I mean, we're looking at five to ten times that, maybe an order of magnitude bigger than that in some of these. And so, uh, and then lastly, our ice jam floods, where you have ice building up, 
uh, in some of the uh, mountains, especially the mountainous areas, and then all of a sudden catastrophically fail, releasing a wall of water. Those are catastrophic. Now, uh, the ones at the top are meteorological based, all right? Atmospheric water falls on the ground and we have the flooding, all right? Uh, the others are, are not are non-meteorological. Uh, storm tide floods are from hurricanes or tropical storms. These other floods that we're talking about down here, I'm not gonna discuss those tonight. I'm gonna stick to either meteorological floods caused by rainfall or snow melt or whatever, or the storm tide kind, kind of situations. Um, I do wanna make a, a quick categorization is the flash floods. That's a flat, uh, category based on onset of the flooding. Some of the floods, like on the Mississippi River, are very slow. They come up gradually, maybe a foot every couple days, and they stay forever. They're like a bad house guest, okay? Whereas flash floods, you can have two or three feet of water come up in five minutes, okay? And these are more uh, in the hillier terrain, smaller basins that are usually suspect to uh, having flooding based on convective thunderstorms. And uh, we also have dam breaks. That would be a flash flood. You know, you lose your dam or your, your ice jam or whatever. That would be a, a quick onset. We're gonna, as I've said, we're going to concentrate in, in that area, the spectrum, in terms of our flood types. And so if I look at the hydrology of meteorological flooding, most of you have seen this. This is the water cycle. You get the moisture circulation. Basically, all floods are is just the, the water cycle gone bad. You just got too much water in too little time in one location, more than normal. And so if I look at that, I have to look at the rainfall runoff response. And this is just a little cartoon kind of showing you the elements that we have to consider when we try to understand the physics and we have to model the situation. And so we have precipitation falling. You have interception. If you've got plant cover out there or tree cover, it's going to intercept some of it. Some of it's going to fall to the ground. Some of it's going to, once it gets to the ground, it's going to infiltrate. Some of it will directly run off after infiltration through surface runoff. Some will percolate into the deep groundwater. Some will have a through flow or, or interflow where it will actually go through the shallow zone of the ground and go out into the river. So we understand a lot of these, comp these uh, processes physically, but it's very difficult to actually model these in concept because the ground is so uh, non-uniform in terms of its uh, characteristics, uh, the plant cover is non-uniform. That becomes a real challenge whenever we try to understand what the process is of moving uh, water from a rainfall or an atmospheric process into actually a stream flow. So what are some of the factors that govern meteorological flooding? The geology and soil plays a big, big role, uh, the land use, uh, the type and amount of precipitation, where it came from, the storm track, what was the orientation of the basin of that storm track? How long? Is it was an elliptical long watershed or was it really short and squat? If it was really long, it takes a little longer for the water to get from the upper end of the basin down to the bottom end. So you have all those characteristics. And we, here is a cartoon of looking at two different types of floods from the same rainfall. And, there, and you can see these in, in practice where you actually have uh, different types of responses with the same rainfall just because the basin characteristics are a little different. Let's look at land use. I can't look at all those characteristics. I just want to show you a couple of examples. These are from Washington State. And this is rural versus urban. You know, you pave over things. Uh, you hydraulically connect people's roofs to the street. And it goes right into the gutters, which is, goes right in the stream. That's a very rapid response to the rainfall. And so that's a much more rapid response than what you'd have in a rural setting where it falls into agricultural land that's not hydraulically con connected directly to a gutter or, or, or a street system. And so you get two different types of responses there. If you look at the annual peak flow data, and remember I showed you the, the Mississippi River Vicksburg where we had the annual peak. So we take the largest stream flow in any given year. We call it our peak flow for that year. And then we take all those peak flows of every year and we plot that and that's what we've done here. And you can see the impact of urbanization on these particular streams through the years, starting 1960 on the left, proceeding to present day. And you can see in an urban situation with this particular gauge here, uh, you've got very little trend of the data. It's, in fact, the, the trend line is, is pretty flat. Okay. Whereas in the urbanization, you look at the scatter plot of that, there's a definite trend upward, and that's purely due to the urbanization of the system. Precip has a, a, is a huge role, and basically uh, the proximity to your moisture source is a big driver there. If you look here uh, in the United States, uh, our big moisture source 
uh, for the eastern part is the Gulf of Mexico. You do have some Atlantic Ocean uh, influence at different times of the year, but for the predominant uh, moisture producer is the Gulf of Mexico. And you can see that, and this is the annual mean precipitation. The farther away from the source you get, the less uh, precip you get. On the west coast, obviously the Pacific, and you get away from uh, the Pacific and you start to lose it. This is a very arid, dry location. But you do have pockets of, of high precipitation totals for the year. And a lot of that's due to what we call orographic lifting, where you have uh, masses of air move in and as they rise up over the, uh, the topography, um, they dump out a lot of rain. And so on the windward side of these, these uh, uh, topographic uh, features, you have a lot of the rain. By the time it gets to the lee side, or the, the in most cases the eastern side in the United States, it's, it's dropped out its rain and you get more air. So you can see the the arid, the, the shadows of the, the rain shadows in these arid areas in the Rockies. You get along the Rockies, you get a lot of rain, you know, but once it gets out into eastern Colorado and Kansas, you, you, you quickly drop off. And so um, the topography it enhances the precipitation, and you see that uh, in a lot of places. We see that down here in the Ozarks in Arkansas and Missouri, where the Gulf moisture comes up, hits the Ozarks, rises up, and drops out a lot of rain. We have a lot of tremendous rainstorms coming out of that, that area just as well. In Texas is another one with the escarpment of the Peconies. Escarpment is another location for that. So what are some generalities? I can't go into all the details, but let's just talk about some generalities that control flooding in the United States, or they're basically anywhere for that matter. Floods can happen at any time, but by the most part, most areas have a rainy season that's going to dominate the flooding picture. Uh, northern U.S. and mountain basins, snowmelt plays a huge role. Uh, the closer you are to the source of moisture, more likelihood for extreme flooding. Small basins, the dominant feature meteorologically that's going to drive flooding are short duration, high intensity convective thunderstorms. Large basins are going to be those longer duration, more frontal or uh, extra tropical cyclonic or even tropical cyclonic, which we're talking about with, uh, with Irene and, and Lee today. We're going to talk a little bit about that tonight. Uh, those, those are going to be uh, forces that are going to be widespread. And they're going to dump a lot of rain over a long period of time, and they're going to get those, those basins up and, and really flooding. And then topographic relief plays a large role in how severe the flooding can be, and we'll talk a little bit about that as well. Here's the snow melt potential here. This is basically just the average snowfall, and you can see that along the Rockies and the northern tier states, that's where we're getting our, our snow, and then also along the Cascade Range and the Sierras, uh, we also have a lot of snow. So where you get a lot of snow, you can store up that moisture potential in the form of snow, and you can, once you melt it, that's just like it raining, only it may come much quicker than if you have 10 inches of snow water equivalent in the snow, and it melts in a couple days, that's like having a 10 inch rainstorm in 48 hours, pretty, pretty intense rain. Um, this is a graphic out of a, a USGS water supply paper, and uh, this is basically the typical seasons for the largest annual flood. And, and I, I didn't believe this at first, and so I did a lot of plotting of data, and I, st I started looking around, and what I did was I played with a lot of the gauges that I know about all around the country, just pick picked out various gauges. And this is a Mississippi River at St. Louis, and I took the annual peak flow file with all the floods, and I said, when does the Mississippi River at St. Louis typically flood? So what, you know, I took all, you know, there's 115 years of record there. And I said, how many floods do we have in March? How many of the annual floods were in March? How many of the annual floods were in April? So on. So that's what this graphic is. And you can see that predominantly we're talking April to June. Okay, in there for the peak flow. And so I did that for a number of the gauges around here. And, and surprisingly, I, uh, I should not have doubted it was USGS publication. It should have been right, right? So uh, we see on the West Coast in California, predominantly driven winter storms, okay, winter floods. Colorado, this is Clear Creek at Golden, Colorado. This is June. I mean, this is dr dramatically driven by snowmelt. Okay, you have thunderstorms in, in Golden, Colorado as well, but the primary driver for flooding in Golden, Colorado is snowmelt. You see this down in Arizona where you get the monsoonal uh, system, the flows in the late summer. And uh, 
this is, again, this is a small watershed, so sometimes it's a little, uh, you can be more driven by thunderstorms. Uh, but here's Mississippi River. This is the Potomac River at Point of Rocks, Maryland. You can see it's driven by some of the similar kinds of things. It's a large watershed, not quite as big as the Mississippi, but it's driven by the same kind of uh, distribution uh, with floods, with the exception it has a tail out here. It has a second uh, peak of flooding, and that's due to usually the hurricanes. Okay, as you get those moisture sources occasionally get up through the East Coast, and we'll talk about Irene and Lee as one of those types of systems that, uh, that, that drive a lot of moisture. This is uh, Sarasota Springs, or I'm sorry, Swanee River near Swanee Springs, uh, Florida. And you can see that's also a bimodal distribution. You get the spring flooding, but then you get this uh, flooding that happens in September. And what is the peak season for hurricanes in the United States? It's September, okay, as you look at it. People, the hurricane season runs from June 1st into November, and we've had relatively minor hurricane activity, but folks, we're still not quite in the peak hurricane season yet, so there's a lot of the season left. Um, I also wanted to put this up here. This is the difference to, in talking to you about what's the major driver for flooding. This is a large watershed in the, in the Midwest, Wabash River, Terre Haute, Indiana. This is in the order of 10 to 15,000 square miles. And you can see the distribution is mainly uh, late winter into the spring. And then we have Boneyard Creek at Urbana, Illinois, which is about 10 square miles. This is on the University of Illinois campus. I know this stream really well. Uh, and so you can see here that it's got a wider distribution. This is a small watershed, and it's, it's more susceptible to thunderstorms. So you have much more of a distribution of rain uh, or floods out in later into the summer thunderstorm season that will be the peak driver uh, of flooding there. One of our research team, uh, Jim O'Connor, who's out of uh, uh, the West Coast, and John Costa, who was my predecessor in this job, did a, did a lot of research looking at the largest floods in the United States. And so what they did was they took all the stream gauges that we've ever operated, and they took the largest flood on that stream gauge and they plotted it. Drainage area in square miles versus the peak flow rate here. And so this is a this black cloud here is all those, there's probably 10, 15,000 points there. Because even though we just operate 7,800 stream gauges right now, we've got others that have been discontinued. So this is a bigger data set than that. And so they took and said, okay, of those, what are the bigger peaks? What are the, let's look at the 13% is basically what this line is. These are the, what the, the larger of the floods, because you can see that this is a Willamette River at Salem, Oregon. It's only 7,280 square miles. It has a peak flow rate up here around 300,000 cubic feet per second. And over in Nebraska, we've got a gauge on the Platte River that's much bigger in order, order of magnitude in terms of drain size, but it has a much smaller flow. And so they were looking at the aspect, what drives large floods? I mean, every stream floods, but some flood a whole lot more and a whole lot more ca catastrophically than others. So what are the controlling features of that? And so that's what their research was about. So they took those 13% of the floods, and these are all the gauges that plotted in that upper 13% of all those, made, those floods, okay? This is the original graphic here of all the gauges around the country in the lower right-hand corner. And then these are the gauges that made that upper cut. And so they looked at, okay, what, what are the drivers here that are causing this particular kind of flooding? And basically, without going into a tremendous amount of detail, proximity to the moisture source, because you see here, Coming out of the Gulf, you can have some, some uh, we have a large distribution of the, of the points are right here in the, in the Mid-South, in the, in the Central uh, Midwest. You have a lot around the, uh, the western edge of the United States, and then again up here in the Appalachians, okay, around the corner. And so it's not just proximity to the moisture source. That's an important factor, but why don't we have more in Florida? They have a lot of stuff going on down there, but it's flatter than a pancake. All right, so you have to have something to do with topography as well, because the steeper the gradient on the, on the watershed, the quicker it can funnel water together, and then you get these catastrophic types of floods. And so that topographic relief plays a major role. All right, so I wanted to kind of set the context for the anatomy. Now I want to actually get into the flooding, all right? 2011, well, they, everybody calls it an epic. I mean, you know, I'm always skeptical with words. You get everything in an email, and somebody says this or that, and, and we've really, uh, we're really loose with our terminology these days because we'll call something fantastic. Well, it may not be so fantastic, or it's awesome, or whatever. So we've been calling 2011 an epic year. And so, you know, epic is extending beyond the usual, okay, or ordinary, especially in size or scope, and it wasn't really epic. And I 
you know, I've, I've looked at floods for a number of years now, and I have to say 2011 was an epic year of flooding. Not only did we have the central United States, March through July, and we had floods from the Canadian border to the Gulf of Mexico, from the Rocky Mountains to uh, the foothills of the Appalachians on the west side. Uh, we had uh, a lot of deaths. Again, 36 deaths is not a lot compared to the, the uh, extent of the flooding, but a lot of that's because the flooding's a lot slower out there in the Midwest. Okay, people can get out of the way, but we sure had a whole lot of damages. Hurricane Irene arrived in August, and we had 45 deaths. deaths. We had storm tide uh, flooding, and we had riverine flooding. Uh, we had $7.3 billion in damage. This is squishy because I couldn't, I don't have any data that separates out wind from the flooding. So there's wind damage in here as well. So this may look like it's more than the central United States for, for flooding damages, but I don't really know if it's bigger in terms of flooding damages because wind is included in it as well. And then we had right two weeks later after Irene, we had Tropical Storm Lee on its tail and uh, we had 21 deaths and it was minor in comparison, only a billion dollars in damage. But this is pretty much flood damage because we didn't have a lot of wind with Lee. I mean, there was wind, but not compared to what we saw with Irene, especially down on the lower part of the basin or the uh, Atlantic coast. All right, when we go out, we have a flood. Our folks are out there. These are a couple of pictures from the, the central United States. And these red dots on our real-time pages are when those guys and gals are actually out there making flood measurements. This is a flooded highway. They're measuring the overflow. They're in a, a personal flotation device here. We have to have these uh, pictures sanitized for our safety people. So if safety folks out there, we're doing our job. We're keeping them in the PFDs. And they're making a flow measurement down the middle of the highway there, of the flow actually coming over the, of the road. And so as we're doing this, we're checking out our rating curve. I've already talked to you about rating curves. We're doing it because those rating curves change. Okay, it's a natural system and, it, and we can get changes uh, with that natural system. As I look around here, and this, we're gonna have to update this slide because I couldn't get it updated for the talk. This is one we put together for a congressional briefing uh, within the Office of Surface Water. And, and basically these are the major, uh, these are basically the major flood peaks and the red ones are the peaks of record. So all the years we've got data, the red dots are we have peaks of record. Northeastern part of the United States, that's just reflecting of the May flooding. I don't have Lee and Irene. We had over almost 150 peaks of record in Northeastern United States from Irene and Lee. So we've got to update this graphic, but I just want to give you the, the idea when we talk about epic flooding, we had flooding all over the country, not just in the central United States and the Northeast. So when we talk about that central US flooding, you know, snow melt, rain or snow, rainfall, we had over 100 peaks of record. 450 USGS stream gauges. Uh, I had uh, floods that were 10% probability or less. Um, we had a lot of, of snow melt there. This is snow water equivalent. 2011, we had in, in excess in some parts of 14 to 15 inches of moisture in the form of snowpack in parts of the, especially in Montana. And so the system was loaded and we didn't Without any rainfall, we knew we were going to have a pretty good flood, and then the rains hit. And so March through April, we had snow melt with additional rainfall. We had flooding in the uh, Red River of the north and, uh, and, and, the, and basically the upper Mississippi and down in the lower Missouri. Then April, May hit, we had another round of major rainfall, and we got the flooding in the lower Ohio and the lower Mississippi. They ended up, the Corps of Engineers, it was all over the media, they ended up blowing the levee at the Birds Point New Madrid floodway and having to use that in order to protect other towns. And so that was during the April, May. <clears throat> and then we got the, the late snow melt in Montana. And then on top of that, we got a year's worth of rain in Montana over Memorial Day weekend. And so it just overwhelmed the reservoirs in the Missouri River and caused catastrophic flooding there. And then June, July, we had excessive rainfall uh, that, that basically pushed the Suris River in Minot, North Dakota over the levee. I mean, tremendous amounts of of rain and snow melt combined with it. Had, it was above flood stage in Minot for over 131 days during 2011. That's a long time to have a flood. If we look at the observed uh, precip, you can just see that we were, were as much as uh, two to 400% above normal in a large part of the country. Uh, rainfall totals, we're looking at uh, anywhere from uh, 20 inches down here in the Ohio River Basin. Okay, these, these white are, are 20 inches of rainfall. Uh, departure from the normal, greater than eight inches or more. This is April and May. 
Uh, and when we look at the Mississippi River, this plot here is looking from Bemidji, Minnesota, down to Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And the red is the 2011 flood. So at St. Paul, we've got all the floods for the entire period of record on here. The red shows you where it compares. So you get down below Cairo, Illinois, that's where the flood was major on the Mississippi River. Upstream of that, it wasn't such a big deal. Same thing on the Missouri River. And the big story on the Missouri was not the peak of the flood because we have floods that were bigger on almost every location along the Missouri River. It was more the volume. This is a gauge on the North Platte River in Wyoming, and basically this is through the water year, and this is what normally in this green area here would what we would expect in terms to accumulate in terms of the volume of the flow. And you can see by the end, we weren't even toward the end of the, of the year yet, we had eclipsed by, and this is not just, I didn't just pick this gauge out, this was common on most of the gauges that we saw out in, the, uh, in that Rocky Mountain area in Montana and Wyoming. All right, so the Birds Point New Mandarin floodway that was here at uh, Cairo, Illinois, Ohio, coming in the Mississippi. This is where we're at geographically. And so the Corps had to make a big decision. They ended up having to blow the levee. They had Cairo, Illinois up here was about to flood. And so in 19, after the 27 flood, the Corps designed this floodway to basically re relieve water. If they blew it up here and blew it down here, they added, they added conveyance and were able to, to get rid of a funnel and they would to widen the floodplain basically is what they do. And you can, you can convey more water at a, at a lower uh, elevation. And so that's what they ended up doing. 10 o'clock on May 2nd, we were on the levee, uh, not where they were blowing it, about a mile back. They blew the levee up here, and this is what you saw. Uh, basically, a lot of water everywhere. We instrumented the entire floodway, we being USGS, went out and instrumented the entire floodway because this is a unique scientific opportunity to look at a dam break, or a levee break, and to see how the water moves through the system. And so every day we would come in after they blew it. This is, I'm standing on the levee here. This is one of our boat crews. We're actually measuring the value of the water. We had as much as 400,000 cubic feet per second going across that floodway. And basically it dropped the level of the Mississippi River up at Cairo by about three feet overnight. And so they were able to preserve and not overtop the levee there along with some of their other levees that they were concerned about. This is a Landsat, USGS Landsat imagery. This is prior to, and then this is after uh, they breached the, the floodway so you can see what it looks like. Um, the the uh, Coast Guard was real concerned about navigation traffic. They got all these barges. What happens here when we blow this levee? Are we gonna suck tow boats into the Missouri shore into these trees? So we went out prior to, and after the breaching of the levee, we actually mapped the velocities with one of our field crews, and we were able to provide them this data in about 20 minutes after being done with it. We have software that we can produce this, and the Coast Guard made the decision after seeing our data to reopen the river to navigation traffic, and they, they felt it was safe because the velocity vectors weren't any different prior to and after the, uh, the breaching of the levee. All right, so moving on to Irene and Lee. Uh, there's the dates. This is a picture of what Irene looked like on the 27th of August. And storm uh, hurricane storm tide is the thing that kills most of the people, it's not the wind. And so the USGS has been involved, uh, since Katrina, have been involved in a program where we try to measure storm tide. And why is that important? Because NOAA runs models to try to predict storm tide as they have a, a hurricane coming on shore. And so you have to, just like we do for riverine flooding, we have to have data to calibrate those models. We need the same kind of thing for calibrating models of storm tide. And so this is a, a sensor. It's self-contained. We go out and install it in the, in the onset just before the hurricanes makes land shore. We have our field staff out there strapping this, these instruments to anything we think will still be there once the hurricane leaves. Okay, we'll go out and recover the sensor and then we can survey in the sensor elevation and we have a, a basically a, a look at how much the storm tide was. This is after Rita. You can see that we had, uh, that's about six, seven, eight feet of storm tide there. Uh, and we were able to look at that t uh, uh, time series of data and we have them all over the place. Uh, and during Irene, uh, oh, th this is just a look at some of the data here, and you can see during Irene, this is down in North Carolina. We didn't quite get the storm surge that we wanted. Most places are four to five feet uh, down there, but uh, we, we really are looking at category three and above storms. We're really trying to measure those storm tides. Um, you know what? My, uh, I'm having trouble getting my uh, uh, 
I have a slide that's embedded here somehow and it's, it's disappeared on me. We had the largest deployment of storm tide sensors that USGS has, already put, has ever put out for Irene. We deployed all the way from Georgia uh, almost to Maine. Okay, and so we, I think there's 200, it's on my side. I think we had 278 sensors that we deployed out during Irene in anticipation of that storm tide. This is the track of Irene. Uh, Lee came in from the south, and you can see the amount of rainfall that it dumped with it. Uh, we had an excess of uh, 10 inches in some parts for Irene, and uh, the same kind of thing for, for Lee. It was a little shifted to the west, and you had a lot more rain down in here in the, in the southern Gulf uh, uh, coast uh, states. Um, in this area, this is the total precip for Irene and Lee. Uh, we had uh, somewhere in the neighborhood uh, uh, 15 to 24 inches uh, in the uh, in the areas of northern Virginia, uh, southern Maryland, and you see that's a whole lot of rain in a short amount of time. Uh, this is a graphic of <clears throat> two sites, Shahari Creek and Susquehanna. Uh, the two major rivers that were impacted by Irene and Lee were the Susquehanna and the Shahari Creek. Those are the, some of the major massive floods we saw. There were a lot of other rivers that were involved and had peak of records, but these are two of, of the more dramatic examples. And you can see here, this is a hydrograph, uh, and this is a Shahari Creek uh, here, uh, peaking, uh, does a really uh, a huge uh, uh, flood peak here with uh, Irene and not so big with uh, with Lee. It's still uh, quite a bit though. Uh, it's a, it's a fairly rare flood even for Lee. But uh, Irene looked like it dwarfs it. So you know if you were to put up uh, just the Lee data in comparison with everything else, it looked like a huge flood. But uh, Irene was so much bigger in terms of that particular site. If we look at Susquehanna, uh, it was the opposite where we had the huge uh, flood uh, during Lee. And uh, you, you can see that here in the lag time. So you had a double whammy with Irene and Lee, separated by a couple of weeks. These are the peaks of record, and you can see geographically where they're, they're distributed here. We've got the track of Lee here, and, and of course uh, we lose the track here because it turns into, uh, into more of a, an extra tropical cyclone at that point, and they don't track it anymore. And then this is Irene, and you can see where we've had Irene peaks, and just to the west of that is where we had most of the Lee peaks. Um, Near here, this is four mile run at uh, Alexandria, and basically I pulled this up to look and see kind of what the comparisons were. And just to show you, this is the peak for Lee, but just prior to that, earlier in August, this is just a peak from a normal thunderstorm. So this just drives home the point, Four Mile Creek is a small watershed that you don't have to have these massive uh, storms to drive the flood peaks up there. They're not necessarily the controlling feature. You can have just a convective isolated thunderstorm causing a major flood. Okay, Lee and Irene were big, big floods, obviously, but it takes it. They're the the driving factor for them are more the larger watersheds, the the ten, you know, the thousand to ten thousand square mile watersheds, where these smaller watersheds like Four Mile Run are more controlled by convective thunderstorms. All right, this is a, the flood peaks here. You can see that the 2007 peak or 2006 peak is the big one. Uh, the one we had here in 2011. Uh, wasn't you know anything special. We have a whole lot of floods that were higher than that just for this area. Now we did have some stream gauges or some streams in the rest and area that were hugely impacted. There's very isolated, huge rainstorms. I mean, I know in Reston here, you, uh, the estimate was uh, greater than 500 year rain, uh, rainfall uh, amounts in certain parts, and there was a lot of destruction. But you know, you move over uh, several miles, and you don't you don't get quite that rainfall. So it's highly uh, uh, spatially varied. All right. Uh, when we look at the flooding from Lee, we had over in Irene, we had over 140 peaks of record. This is a picture taken. This is a house hitting the bridge. Uh, I think this is on the Susquehanna. Bob Hanley, do you know for sure? I got this picture, I think, from one of your guys' water science center. Um, you know, the uh, Susquehanna, Shahari, and then the Deerfield over in Massachusetts. Those were three of the, the bigger rivers that uh, we had we had issues with. Um, this is the Patapsco River, and I'm slaying this pronunciation, but I throw this up because Agnes was a huge flood in 1972, and you can see where it was at, and then you can see a comparison with Irene and Lee, just to kind of put things in context, okay? This is in uh, over west of the Baltimore area. Uh, this is the Potomac River at Point of Rocks, and you can see here, uh, this is 2011, but we've got a whole lot of floods that were much bigger uh, for the Potomac. Uh, the Susquehanna, uh, this is in the lower part of the Susquehanna, 
Um, the Susquehanna was a big flood in the upper part, but not so big in terms of other floods. There were a couple other floods that were bigger. Okay, it was not a peak of record. But as you look at Shahari Creek in Prattsville, New York, uh, you can see that this is this dwarfs everything else. This is the 2011 flood, and then everything else is down in here. Okay, so again, um, it, it was it was a huge flood in certain areas, but not so big in others in terms of what we see in context. Now, where does everything fit in terms of what we had historically? This is that that line that I showed you from John, uh, Jim O'Connor's research and John Costa. And so you can see, I've got the 2011 Central U.S. floods, the Irene and the Lee floods are plotted here. We had some of those that would now fit above that 13% line. So, we, you know, we, we had some massive flooding, some, some catastrophic flooding. Um, real quickly in the closing minutes here, I want to talk to you real briefly about flood frequency and probability. Um, the 100-year flood, everybody says, what the heck? We had two of those in the last 20 years. What was what, the 100-year flood business? Basically, all it is is a probability concept, all right? The 100-year flood has a 1% chance of happening in any given year. Just like the 10% the 10-year flood has a 10% chance, or the 500-year has a 0.2% chance. It's a statistical concept. It doesn't mean it's an exact thing. You're going to have 100 years between 100-year flood. And so, as you look at this, on, on long-term average, we're going to statistically have a flood of that magnitude every 100 years. And you can think of it in looking at the 10-year flood. This is some data I put together to demonstrate this concept on the, that's not Ember, Embarrass, that's the Embraer River by the locals over in Illinois. And so this is uh, basically from 1910 to, I put this talk together uh, about 2009. And what you would expect to see if I'm looking at the 10-year flood, that's right along here. I would expect to see a flood every 10 years if I'm thinking along that concept that, you know, we're, we're kind of stuck in that mindset. But you can see sometimes I go 17 years between 10-year floods. Sometimes I go as small as four years between 10-year floods. Here I've got a span of 28 years between 10-year floods. But if I average those spans, it comes out to guess what? 10 years, right? And so that's all we're talking about here. We could have two 100-year floods one year right after the other. It's, it's, pro it's possible. In fact, in a 30-year life cycle of a mortgage, the, I, th I don't have it committed to memory, I think it's something like 26% chance of having a 100-year flood in the 30-year period. Okay, so that, that's, that's one thing I wanted to mention. I'm running out of time here. Uh, we have to have long-term data. Our 100-year floods, any kind of our flood probability is based on the data that we collect. So the longer our data time span, uh, the better we do. So if I only had uh, 20 years of record here, this is the 100-year flood, this is Cedar River at Cedar Rapids, Iowa. I collect 100 years of data. You can see that that debt value changes. Not only do we have to understand, it's very difficult for the common person to understand what we mean by the 100-year flood because we can have two in, within a successive years, but through time as we collect more data, the target's moving, okay? Because we're getting better at predicting or estimating what that flood is actually about. So anyway, I'm gonna flip through these really quickly. Uh, I wanna show you really quick. Uh, when we talk about the 100-year flood, this is on a gauging station in Missouri, 44,300 CFS, cubic feet per second is the 100-year flood, but the air bars around that are quite large. 56,400, this is our 95% our confidence interval. We are 95% sure that it's somewhere between those bands. So you can see that's a pretty good error. And if you're trying to determine whether your house is in the floodplain based on the 100-year flood, well, there's two feet of difference here in the estimate. Okay, and so the, the caution I always offer people is it's not a it's not a set absolute number. Okay, we're talking uncertainty here that we have to deal with. All right, I'm going to, uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to flip through uh, the rest of these. I was going to talk to you a little bit about paleohydrology, where we're trying to extend our records and collect. Uh, ancient floods as much as uh, two or three thousand years old based on paleo data where we would go in and look at slack water deposits and carbon datum and other mechanisms to, to look at it. We could extend the flood record and you could imagine if we can extend that flood record we get a better idea of what the floods are actually about. So I tell you what, at this point um, I'm going to turn it over to questions because I, I want to be respectful of everybody's time here. Uh, I did want to say that maybe we should have been talking about drought in this talk uh, this was 2011. You can see how wet it was. And this is uh, June of 2012. So uh, maybe I sh we should have had Harry Lenz up here talking about drought. This is the uh, Palmer Drought Index, how much rain's needed to get us out of drought. And you can see in some cases in the Midwest, we need over 15 inches of rain to bring that Palmer Drought Index back to normal standards.